What was your best memory from the war? I don't think there are any best memories. <laughs> but there's some memories that I remember best. <laughs> uh, I, okay, it was okay, except, you know, there's a little bloody here and there, but, but for the most part it wasn't as bad as I'd, it could have been. Lester Ross, who is also known as Jack, is my grandfather. He is my mom's dad, and he has had an important role in my life. Lester Eugene Ross, also known as Jack, was born in Jerome, Idaho on January 26, 1930, a mere three months after the Great Depression commenced. It was an extremely desperate time during his first 10 years of life. different than here. It was, it was uh, less populated and uh, uh, different atmosphere. He spent a large portion of his childhood moving and had gone to 13 different schools by the time he had reached eighth grade. Jack's mom was a single mother with a meager income. When she could not support Jack and his older sister, Dell, she sent them to children's homes. Farmers would offer a home and food to Jack in exchange for free labor. He graduated from Harlem High School in 1948. Gosh, I don't remember the high school being that different, but it was uh, interesting and uh, maybe not quite as, quite as severe as today. I mean, they, they didn't, make a big deal out of everything. When you were in high school, um, what kind of student were you academically? Uh, I, I think more just an average student. I, I wasn't brilliant by any means, and I, I just did what was expected of me that I could do. Yeah. Jack's rough childhood helped shape his character into who he is today. Well, I played football a lot, yeah. How was that like? Oh, well, I, I was, for my size, I thought I was kind of an aggressive football player, but, uh, you know, I'm a little smaller than most, but I played regular all the time. What position did you play? A guard. All four years? Uh, all four years, I was right guard all the time. Following his high school graduation, Jack enlisted in the Marine Corps. I was part of a, a, a local military group. I think it was to uh, delay how fast I was going, but since the war went so fast, it didn't delay anything. I was kind of young, but I was very conscious of how the war was going and everything. First day in Korea like? Oh boy, I don't know if I know exactly, but uh, it didn't seem so much different than us. We weren't fighting right away.
we went up the right side of Korea for a while, and we went back and went around and went up the left side of Korea. <laughs> so, you know, when you're there, you don't get directions. <laughs> I was a uh, corporal by that time. Uh, I, uh, well, I actually I was a corporal, but uh, they were short of people, so I was really really eating a platoon, which is a uh, sergeant's job. Well, it was a lot colder there than everywhere else. And it was, the frozen chosen was like, there was this lake. And I remember the road came around it this way. And that's where the frozen chosen was. The Chosen Reservoir is a man-made lake located in Changjin County, North Korea, in the northeastern peninsula. The battle's main focus was around the 78-mile-long road that connects Hongnam and the Chosen Reservoir. The battle began November 27, 1950, and lasted 17 brutal days. Can you share some of your experiences? Gee, I don't know. It's it's uh, kind of it's just come over a ridge and there's fighting and you pull back and then you go back and I don't know and it's just you keep fighting one way or another. Under command of Major General Oliver P. Smith, thirty thousand American troops were attacked by one hundred twenty thousand Chinese troops. The Marines were caught off guard. They were greatly outnumbered and were at risk of annihilation. The battle was fought over some of the toughest terrain during the harshest winter conditions of the Korean War. A bitter cold front from Siberia descended over the Chosen Reservoir and the temperature plunged to a chilling 35 degrees below zero. Incidents of gangrene and frostbite were rampant, but the Marines continued on. The men marched during the day and shot at the enemy during the night but they persevered and never stopped fighting. Everybody was for one another, and every time you looked over a hill, you had a bunch of other heads looking over the same hill and, and trying to make sure that you, you were doing a, the right thing together. I didn't have any hatred or anything. I just knew they were the enemy. I tried to protect yourself against them, that's all. Uh, kind of depended on whether we were like we were up in the front lines if you're on the front lines, you usually seem like you're always looking over a hill at the other guys over there, and they were like uh, half a mile or a mile away from you. Oh, was I injured? Heck, I don't know where I was injured. I say the shot in the leg. I, I don't remember. <laughs> Just shot. in the wrong place at the wrong time. <laughs> Jack was shot in the leg and was transported to Japan to recuperate. I got shot in the right leg, near the ankle, and that was the main thing. Not long after returning to active duty, a mortar exploded nearby. I'd been shot here and it went right up my elbow. So. And then did I you... I think still got the bullet in there. Yeah, there's shrapnel. How did you kind of cope with the fighting and kind of being in a different place? Um, I, you know, I don't know, you just followed one another, the guy ahead of you did it, so you did it. And it, you just tried to make sure you were following the same pattern and getting things done. Okay, it was okay, except, you know, there's a little bloody here and there, but, but for the most part, it wasn't as bad as I, it could have been. God, I don't know what my last day was like, but I, uh, I just took things as they were, and I, I don't remember that it was a specific time, but... Were you happy to go home? 
Huh? Were you happy well, to be sure. leaving? Well, sure. Yeah, you're always happy to get rid of the fighting. I probably met her through the telephone company, that's all. Yes, I think that's right. And, and they had an upstairs uh, room where they had uh, food and so forth. But I worked out in the field. I mean, I worked at the west side of Rockford. Jack and his wife, Benita, were married on September 19, 1959, and had four kids. Jack and Benita were married for 55 years. Oh, 55 years? That's about right. <laughs> Suddenly, Jack's life changed immensely. Bonita was diagnosed with terminal cancer and passed on October 13, 2014, a mere four weeks after being diagnosed. Bonita was Jack's entire world, and that just flipped upside down. I don't know. It's just like a coincidence and a matter, and it wasn't her right at first, but then it became her and me. And A couple years before my grandma had passed, probably two or three, we noticed that he had the beginning stages of dementia. Um, he would forget little things, and it was just simple things that we just had placed that, oh, he's getting older, it's no big deal. And then it began to come to the point where he was forgetting his kids' names and his grandchildren's names. And he forgot bigger things like memories and big things, important things. And that played a huge factor in how the interview went and how the doc was going to go. And a lot of the times my when I was growing up, I spent a large majority of the time or at my grandparents' house. And rather it be they were babysitting me while my parents were at work, or as, as I got older and my brother and I got older, we would just go over there just to hang out. We would, every Saturday was spent going to the library and checking out books and reading them and getting lunch and just hanging out and having a good time and just simply enjoying the fact that they were our grandparents. Both Jack and Benita were two of my best friends and both played a huge role in who I am today. Jack's always been an important influence in my life and my family's life and he always made sure that I pushed myself, whether it be my schooling or my sports or anything I did, it was, you need to push yourself. You need to do best. You can do better than that. Because even when I thought I couldn't accomplish it, my grandpa knew that I could and simply believed in me and that just helped me. Kids my age take so many things for granted when when it comes to things and we truly don't realize what it was like to be in war like that. And we just don't make sense of it all. I think Jack's dementia has not only been hard on him, but it's been hard on his family. It's been tiring and painful it's been, it's one thing to not have him remember your name, but after my grand grandmother passed, he kept asking what happened to her, and it was like he didn't know, so we had to rip the Band-Aid off over and over again and continue to tell him that she had passed. And I think that that's almost as hard as actually losing her was. And I think that seeing how Jack faced battles in Korea and how he 
he put his life on the line for, for people in the country that he didn't even know. And it, it's just a huge thing because veterans are selfless and they're putting their own lives on the line and this class means so much to me. I just thought it was gonna be so simple and I truly didn't realize what this class was until it was almost over. And I, I took it for granted. I took, I just needed to realize that there's a reason behind everyone's story and everyone does have a story and veterans especially have the reason to push down their stories and not talk about them. This class truly changed me because it helped me open up my eyes and it made me realize that veterans don't get as much appreciation as they deserve. And it's not simply just standing when the flag passes you by or having your hand over your heart during the Pledge of Allegiance or just thanking a veteran. That all means a lot to them, but it's not, it's nothing compared to what they went through. These veterans went through is so much more than what you can take from a history class. A history class gives you nothing as to what truly happened over there until you see through a veteran's eyes what happened and what they endured. And most importantly, I wanna say thank you to my grandfather for being one of the biggest inspirations in my life and for being a huge role model that I continue to look up to and for always pushing me to, me, to be my best, even when I didn't believe in myself. Thank you, Jack, for being my grandfather.